And welcome back to GMT with me, David Eads. Now, how much would I have to pay you to give up your Facebook account? It can be hard to measure the monetary value of something you don't actually pay for, but that is what a group of US academics have done in a recent study on Facebook. They estimated the value of the application to its users essentially by paying them to give it up. Through a series of experiments, they found that the average Facebook user would need more than $1,000 to deactivate their account for one year. Well, let's have a word now with uh, one of the report's co-authors in Pennsylvania. That's Professor Matthew Rosu from the Susquehanna University there. And uh, also with me in the studio, I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Kent from King's College London. Well, thank you both very much indeed for joining us. Matthew, let me start with you. Um, I mean, I'm intrigued slightly about how you arrive at this figure of $1,000. Sure. We ran what are called experimental auctions, where people were literally bidding for how much compensation they would need to give up their Facebook accounts. Uh, we had different series of times for different groups, different samples, uh, slightly different methods across the team's co-authors, but we consistently found um, on average users would take over a, it would take over $1,000 to okay. deactivate for a year. And, and, and is it possible to compare that to, to anything else? I mean, we could look at, I don't know, eBay, <laughs> Amazon, newspapers, other things like that, just to give us an idea as to how, how much we value Facebook, I suppose. Sure, and, and I don't know the estimates off the top of my head versus the others, but uh, a number of these applications are essentially free to use. Um, a number of applications are free to use, like Google searches, and yet they have enormous uh, consumer surplus is the phrase that economists would use, value to the, those, the end users. Okay, uh, Rachel, are you surprised at that figure, $1,000? Yeah, I am surprised. I think we need to kind of contextualise that as well post Cambridge Analytica and post the European um, Union's GDPR regulation that was enforced as of May this year. So um, all the downside that's hit Facebook about the way in which they're using our information, basically. Absolutely, and the kind of trust and reliability that the users actually have perceived of Facebook to be, I think, and also the generational divides in terms of how Facebook is used. So when you say you're surprised, you, you say you're surprised it's so high? I am surprised it's that high. I think that I wonder whether that figure would be far lower now post Cambridge Analytica and if we actually look at what's happened particularly in the last year for Facebook, especially in terms of the kind of data uh, privacy scandals and the kind of invasions to data mining, etc., that I think now has become far more a part of the public conversation. Interesting. Let me, let me put that to you, Matthew. How, how yeah. far were you able to sort of factor that into account uh, and would would you expect different results today well it's a great question and I, I don't know what it would be today but I think if you think of all the scandals that they've had between Cambridge Analytica and in the US there's a lot of scandals on the influence over the 2016 election or various censorship or data privacy and yet people are still using it the number of users is not dropping I think in some ways that helps validate that their users do place an enormous value because some of these things are, many people think, are really a total outrage, and yet people keep using Facebook. Well, what's the best example or what's the best reasoning we can come up with is that it does indeed have a tremendous value to those who use it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost two stories to people, isn't it? There's this outrage at what they're reading about and how dare they use our, our, our data like mm -hmm. that, but I do want to let the family know what I'm up to at Christmas. You know, it's a <laughs> yeah. totally d sort of different perspective on what Facebook's for, I suppose. It is, and I think it's also we have to kind of remember that even though this data mining scandals have become such a pervasive part of the public conversation now, that under awareness that we understand our data is being mined, the voluntarily given up data, sometimes it's knowingly, sometimes it's unknowingly, does that translate into actual understanding of how our data is being mined? I think that's where the confusion can arise. And I think we perhaps need to reframe the public conversation to understand and look at the terms and conditions and have more clarity and transparency with exactly how Facebook is using our data so that we can have be better informed as users. Do, do you think, Matthew, this would translate into saying, Facebook saying, OK, look, sorry about this, guys, but from now on, we're going to have to charge you, um, what is it, what would it be, about um, $20 a week? I, I, I don't know for sure. I do somewhat doubt that. I, I would suspect users might flock to some other, some other sort of social media site uh, if Facebook were to try that, although, once again, we did, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we attempted to, to discover. No, fair enough. What, what might be within the scope, though, is, is the age range as well, because we hear a lot about, sure. I think about five years ago, all the talk was 
if you were a 50-something-year-old woman, you were probably in the fastest-growing demographic within Facebook. Sure. Uh, and what about youth of today? So, so we did. Uh, we had college students, and before we we ran the experiments, we were considering what would be the social media site we should use, what what to study. And in doing a survey, while young, while college students might say their Facebook is becoming less popular, it was polled as the most commonly used social media site among at least among the sample of college students that we looked at one of the samples was a group of college students at a uh, at a university in ohio that was one of the three samples so the, the message rachel was, it holds up it holds up incredibly well in spite yeah. of everything it holds up but i think we need to think about the different types of content that people are sharing and what they're using the platform for so the elder generations are using facebook to be more kind of confessional the day-to-day -day sharing of content whereas the younger generations are shifting more towards the visual platforms of Instagram which they do conceive as being more private that's a lot of what my research was identifying as considering that to be a more private space well, it, it's not going under tomorrow that's for sure Rachel Kent Matthew Rossi thank you both very much indeed thanks for joining us on GMT